through the garage here that's a front loading garage, which is at the back of the house. I want to take this house where the dining room was nine feet wide, and I wanted to do a bump out of two feet. The deed restrictions in that block were three foot setbacks on either side. There's 14 feet from where the proposed wall was to the build line. It's got a driveway for the car to get there that was approved. And it was denied because I'm not allowed to modify the original structure. Remember, I can do an addition in the back. I could not modify and add two feet of a bump out in the dining room that is continually built throughout my neighborhood. This is a denial where no would mean no. It was denied. Next slide. This is 311 West 16th Street, a one-story bungalow. Next slide. This was the house submitted, a one-story bungalow, keeping the front facade exactly as it was, with an addition to the back, meeting the deed restrictions of the three-foot build line. Denied because my extension on the back, which is the great room to the kitchen, was too close to the neighbor in the historical sense, but not in the deed restriction sense. I'm not real sure how they gauge that, how you know that until you go and submit your plan. This one story addition, renovation, was denied. <coughs> Next slide. This is a perfect example of, of where I struggle also. This house is on the market, it's 1519 Oxford. It's 850 square feet. It's in pretty good shape. I mean, the next slide. The problem with this house is that this living room and dining room combination also is nine and a half feet wide, okay? I can expand out the back of that house, but no matter what I do, you're gonna go through this living room and dining room. There's barely a place for a couch and an armoire for a TV. Going to the next slide. What I want to do, this house has a driveway to the right and 10 feet onto the right. I want to cut the house in the middle, create a center hallway, move the door to the middle, still leave eight feet to the right and eight feet to the left, and remodel this into a three-bedroom, two-bath, one-story bungalow. Denied. I can't modify the original structure. I can't move that door into a more appropriate place because that would be detrimental to the historical nature of this bungalow. I can move out, I can add on to the back, I want to be clear, I can add on to the back. And I can't modify the structure that meets the needs of today's homeowner. And this is where I struggle with them. I get it in the big houses, I get it in the other deals. I'm looking for a future for 1519 Oxford. And the way they make it in this ordinance, I feel is counterproductive to my neighborhood. I'm not talking about four-story townhouses. I'm not talking about the Ashby High Rise. I'm not talking about the glass house from Philip Johnson being built beside you. I'm talking about what are we going to do at 1519 Oxford that creates a bungalow type environment. But this ordinance and its interpretation from the city employees makes this bungalow virtually uninhabitable from a homeowner and it will become a rental house, in my opinion, for the rest of its life until we do something different. The, I get the premise that it stops the Mediterranean mega mansion Tuscan style house from being built next to you, but it does so much more than that. It is destroying the fabric of what is our livelihood in our neighborhood that was growing and being vibrant. And we are firm believers of prevailing lot size, prevailing lot line, more in, uh, restrictive deed restrictions that can limit the size and the setbacks more appropriate. And I think we would find 75% of the homeowners that were in support of those type of restrictions. What I don't support is in my neighborhood, giving architectural control of my house to someone at City Hall that has no accountability to anyone here that has a vested interest or a taxpayer in the neighborhood. I have a problem with that, and I'm not willing to get to allow the other restriction in order to, to give up this. I, I'm not willing to do that. Some people are, some, I, and, and you may walk up to, I'm willing to keep that bungalow the way it is and render it the way it is forever so that I would keep out a Tuscan style house in its place. And, and that is perfectly your right, and I understand that. And I'm not even, I, I support you if that's your right. I don't support that. I think the ordinance is too restrictive and is too harmful for, for the neighborhood. Next slide. 
This is 821 Columbia. This type of house, we have identified 45 houses very similar to this in Heights East and South. Just Heights East and South, you can go a lot of places the river. Typical bungalows that have been, I think, neglected for a long period of time. What are we going to do with 821 Columbia that makes economic sense in our neighborhood? I want to see this house saved. I want to see it remodeled and restored. But I think if they make it so restrictive in what we can do with that house, I don't think anyone's going to do that. I don't think I could convince any of you economically that that makes a sound decision to make. And so houses like this will be subject to a fine. They may or may not impose them, but in the ordinance, structures of this nature, our homeowners that own them, are going to be subject to a fine of five, up to $500 a day that would be imposed on this property. And I assure you if people had the money, they probably would have been fixing up this house. Throughout our neighborhood, there's plenty of older people that do not have the money to maintain the houses in the manner with which the city would like for them to be maintained. They don't have the money to do so. And it creates an undue hardship, I think, on those individuals and those homeowners. We're back here. I got the premise that this house is historic. The mayor lives there. She's got 5,000 square feet she can remodel. She's got 12,000 square feet of land she can add on the back. The ordinance works fine right there. There's not a problem with it working right there. It doesn't harm her in any way. I, I get that premise. She doesn't live in 850 square feet at 1519 Oxford. Not that 18, 1519 Oxford is less valuable than this house, because I don't think it is less valuable. I think it can have a life for another 100 or 200 years. I think the free enterprise system would allow me to cut that house in the middle and create a three bedroom, two bath, one story bungalow that would last another 200 years. This ordinance doesn't give me that opportunity to do so. I'm not in favor of what that does. They have, correct, we're done with the slides. They have improved the appeals process, but what we've always tried to advocate is an appeals process much like a homeowners association where the appeals would have been held back in the neighborhood of vested stakeholders into the deal. They never granted us that. They did grant the final appeal now is to city council. But the premise of the appeals is very limited. You must understand when you make your case to HAHC, when the planning commission receives your appeal, they're bound by the ruling of the HAHC if the HAHC met the letter of the law. And they generally do meet the letter of the law because it's subject to subjection. And the city council will hear your appeal. No new testimony, no new information, no opportunity for you to provide any additional facts. They will review the HAHC, they will review the transcript of the planning commission, and they will make a determination. That's the appeal. That's not the kind of appeal I consider to be true due process for individual homeowners dealing with their personal houses. So they have improved the due process, but it is not one I find acceptable. We'll come back to the questions about the ordinance in a moment. The transition. The transition ordinance is really two issues to deal with. If you're in Woodland Heights and your application was moving forward but not as far along as others, you are still... Woodland Heights and Glenbrook Valley are a special case, and they are grandfathered, and they're going to follow the old procedure of making their application at 51%, having a hearing before the HAHC, and the easiest way, if you're interested in not becoming a historic district in those areas, is to retract your application. It's the only way it's really going to be stopped. If they have 51% of the property owners in support, you'll have an opportunity to protest at the HAHC public session and the planning city public session, but they will have met the letter of the application and it will become a historic district. The only way to stop Woodland Heights and Glenbrook Valley is to retract individuals that have filled out a petition. If you are in one of the other, what were 16 original districts and the Heights South, which is now a historic district of protected status, uh, your process has started. We were waiting for the city petition, which came online uh, yesterday, and our 30-day clock has started. 
we will have 30 days to work on the petition process and how that works. So there's two different transitions on how it's going to work to repeal. That's basically the letter of, of the, uh, the ordinance and how it's impacting you. If you were interested in not being in a historic district, uh, many of you are, I'm going to explain to you my vision for how that's going to work. We are primarily focused on heights east, west, and south. If there are individuals wanting to leave the charge in other neighborhoods, we are here to help you with our process and our information and our science. I am not personally, nor is Mary or, or Kathleen, leading the charge to get rid of all historic districts. Where there's clear understanding and overwhelming support, we think they should have it. But in our neighborhoods, we feel like there's not overwhelming support. We have a master map, and we have mapped out just as an indication signage. It's just my first indication. You would think if you had a yellow sign, <laughs> I have been to every public meeting and hearing that they've had, and the same, similar type people come to the same meeting. People that are definitely for this have been very passionate about it, and, and I applaud them for their love of their neighborhood and what they're trying to do. But they're pretty passionate about it. On the Heights East District, there are 866 track owners, and there are 46 yellow signs that equal 5.3% of the population. 5.3. In Heights South, there are 814 home sites, and they have 26 yellow signs, which equals 3.1% of the population. In Heights West, there are 517 tracts of land, and they have 38 signs, or 7.4% of the tracts identified. That's 110 yellow signs out of 2,197 homeowners. Less than 5% of the people have a yellow sign in my neighborhood. That tells me that there's 95% of the people that either have not decided or are not in favor of that. We're going to go work on those 95%. Leave that 5% alone not going to mess with them, but I have an indication that I can get a large percentage of my neighborhood who do not want to be in support of this. The petition process allows for us to collect these petitions up to 30 days. I intend to take all 30 days. If I got 10%, I'm not stopping. It's my intention to identify homeowners who will sign a petition, and I'm going to get 60% of the tracts of land with a petition over the next 30 days with your help. When I have 60% or more, I will, know, I will dot each little map again, and I will take my petitions and my map demonstrating support at the 60% level, and I will go down to city council on Tuesday, and I will make my public point that my neighborhood is overwhelmingly not in favor of this before your survey even comes out. I'm telling you, they're not in support, and we're going to then walk down to the Planning Commission and submit our petitions in bulk. So we want you to return your petitions back to us so we can keep up with who has signed the petition uh, in favor of reconsideration or resurvey. At the exact same time, not authorized by the city, we're having our own petition that says not only do we want – the petition the city puts out says you want to reconsider. Our petition that we produce – you saw tonight, says we don't want in. And if I walk down there with 60% of the people who want a reconsideration and 60% of the people who are not in support, I will overwhelmingly be able to demonstrate to the city council members that there is not support. In 30 days, I was able to achieve 60% or, or greater or whatever. I think that's a pretty powerful statement. We're going to make the same approach in Heights South and Heights West, wherever else there is. Some districts will only be able to get 10%, and they will get their 10%. What happens after the 10% or the petitions are returned, they will calculate them and map them just like I am. They will kind of check and see where the petitions are coming from. And then a process will start where the city will mail out information about a hearing at the same time they produce a ballot. And the ballots must be returned within 15 days. The ballots are mailed to the address on the Harris County Appraisal.